What is Agent Ignite? Are you wondering how you can make more money and create a competitive advantage for yourself and your clients in this ever competitive real estate industry? Agent Ignite is the key to furthering your knowledge, establishing your expertise, and positioning yourself as a go-to expert. They deliver new and relevant knowledge so you can expand your clientele, close more deals, and ultimately increase income. Each month features a new guest speaker who will deliver on what is most relevant for your business. As a member of DMAR's Market Trends Committee, an avid champion for building wealth through real estate, and a self-proclaimed data geek, Nicole will share market trends and commentary that will add value to you and your clients. Staying up to date on industry statistics coupled with niche topics delivered by industry experts will help you motivate your buyers and sellers and make you more money. Sign up for the next Agent Ignite session at theruthteam.com slash events. This is your daily real estate syndication show, and I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today is a highlight show that's packed with value from different guests around a specific topic. Don't forget to like and subscribe, but also go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can sign up to start investing in real estate today. I hope you enjoy the show. Our guest is Rich Trepanier. Thanks for being on the show, Rich. Thanks for having me, Whitney. I really appreciate it. I guess first, you know, why only value add? Yeah, you know, my brother and I, we've before we got to Austin, Texas, we lived in St. Louis for a little bit and we did a lot of house renovation, but also dabbled in investments of twos and four families in St. Louis. Got a lot out of that experience. We uh, grew up with some construction experience and jumped in, did a lot of work ourselves. We saw a lot of value owning those twos and fours. We got to really see the appreciation from some of the residents that moved into those units after we were done. We did a lot of historic renovation of historic homes in St. Louis. And unfortunately, when uh, 2008, 2009 came, we had to uh, hurry up and get some jobs. So we saw the downgrade in the single family home, but we saw the strength of the multifamily home. And shortly thereafter, I moved to Texas. And as as you know, uh, multifamily is a large strength in Texas as well. Wow. So you, you've seen that multifamily was so much stronger or that business model, yeah. I guess we could say. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it worked out really well. So, you know, could you just elaborate or, you know, just in short, like what value add is? I, of course, we use that term all the yeah. time. I think most listeners have a good handle. However, it's used by so many people. I just love to hear your, you know, definition. Absolutely. And so we're in a perfect area between Austin and San Antonio, where you see a lot of different multifamilies transact between owners and sellers. And traditionally, as many of your listeners know, when uh, a, an acquisition occurs, those new groups of investors want to provide value. They want to add to the community. They want to do upgrades. So they're adding value either through interior renovations, uh, curb appeal, exterior renovations, let's just call an exterior paint and carpentry, some landscaping. We do an awful lot of uh, leasing office renovation, clubhouse renovation, fitness renovation. And so adding value to the residents so they can A, increase rents, but also provide a home to the, to the residents. So, you know, there's so many, there's so many pitfalls when trying to do sure. you know, value add multifamily, right? And, and I thought, you know, with your level of experience, I'd love for you to highlight some of those and let's, let's dig in a little bit. Yeah. So we often deal with investors, you know, our, our goal as a business is to get to the decision makers who are acquiring these communities and get to them early enough where we can help them plan their CapEx budgeting. And so some of the pitfalls that we see is, is oftentimes uh, one of my big things that I um, always cringe a little bit is that you hear people budget their CapEx by doors. And I'm a big proponent, proponent on those interior renovations, doing it based on square footage. And the reason is very simple. If you have $5,000 a door, that number works really well for a one bedroom, one bath, 700 square foot unit. But that doesn't translate very well to a three bedroom, two bath, 1,200 square foot unit. And if you have $5,000, it just doesn't go very well. $5,000 might get you flooring and paint, but it won't get you that granite countertops, those new fixtures, those new faucets. So what I like to do, and when I meet with our investors that we work with, I like to tell them to let's look at it from a square footage standpoint, that your money can go uh, the farthest and that you can accomplish your business plan, which is Let's renovate 72 units. Let's renovate 150 units. You're taking it throughout the entire business plan. Another one I see quite a bit of is is no one provides contingency against that $5,000 per door budget. 
And so add a little bit of contingency on there, a little bit of whoops factor, a little bit of, you know, something will happen on my own business, the construction side of Gage Multifamily Services. We always add in between three to 5% contingency on our bid to our customers. And that helps us kind of alleviate any issues that we might see that we might not see during the, the budgeting process. And the other important one for everyone to remember, another really good pitfall is how do who manages the, the renovation process, the renovation project? Is it going to be your asset manager? Is it going to be the person with your boots on your ground in the city that you're not located in? Is it going to be your property manager? Property managers traditionally charge in between five and 7% roughly to manage manage a renovation project from start to finish. And that five to 7% is calculated based on the gross expenses for the renovation project. Wow. Some great topics there, or at least pitfalls. And, you know, it's interesting talking about budgeting or CapEx by, by door. That's the way I see it all the time as well. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting how you say we should break that down by square footage. And could you just give us a couple of tips in breaking that down like that, or maybe how you yeah, go sure. through that process? Sure. For instance, you know, a lot of times we see a CapEx interior renovation budget. Everyone wants to replace the flooring. So a good rule of thumb for me when we budget for flooring is usually $2 per square foot to take up and put down brand new flooring. Um, we often see on a sea level renovation project, we also see resurfacing of countertops, kitchens and baths. A good, good dollar value there is, is $150 to resurface your kitchen countertops. And then usually between 50 and $60 for your vanity countertops as well. We usually, a good budget value for uh, interior paint per square footage is right around a dollar traditionally is where we usually place it for per square footage for the unit space. And so, uh, we can go even further. We can talk about light fixtures and plumbing fixtures. It just depends on what class level the renovation project is and then how far you want to go. I usually, uh, for first time investors who usually contact me, I usually tell them lipstick on a pig into your renovation for apartment community usually runs about $5.50 a square foot. And that would traditionally get you new flooring, uh, interior paint, resurfacing of countertops, maybe a fixture or two, but it's really a, uh, really what it describes, lipstick on a pig. You're getting in there, you're renovating a unit quickly and trying to get residents back into the unit very fast. That's a great, I, I guess, uh, like a rule of thumb there, I guess, just to, when yeah. we're analyzing deals to understand. You know, we usually, we see anywhere between 550 a square foot on a renovation and then it goes anywhere. You can you can find them as high as $20 a square foot renovation as well. So. Okay. And so, you know, you talked about the contingencies and people not having any kind of buffer yeah. I mean, that's that just, exactly what it, it is. just it's seems to make sense, right? I mean, we have an emergency fund, all those things, you know, that res reserve account for just in case thing, something happens, it's unexpected. I mean, why wouldn't we do that when we're looking at our, our renovation budget? So, uh, you know, let's elaborate a little bit on that. And, you know, you said you all will add like three to 5%. Is there a different amount that you encourage investors to have? You know, it just depends on the level of renovation. Three to 5% is usually a good contingency plan. Like I said, we've, or the bio said, we've done over 2,000 value add projects over the seven years that we've been in business. And so it is, it, that number has worked very well with us. That's what we advise our, um, our investors to do as well. What's important is if you don't have that contingency plan, it's going to affect your overall business plan. When you're underwriting these multifamily deals, you underwrite for the full 120 units on property. You don't say, well, I'm going to underwrite for 75 of these. You underwrite for the full 120. But when issues occur, what usually happens is you start pulling away from the business plans. You might, let's just say you might not renovate the remaining one bedroom units on property because you have to put more money into those two, be two bedroom, two bath units because they're getting their most upside on the renovation. And so contingency just helps alleviate that stress. Again, if a water heater, if your boiler goes out, if you've uh, got a number of HVAC units that need to be replaced, that contingency helps with that. Nice. Or what are some of the top successful investors you see, you know, doing as far as who, who's managing this renovation process like you're talking about? Who do they have managing? Well, usually they work with their property managers. Usually there's a uh, director of construction historically involved with the, the fee management company. Oftentimes you also see asset managers. If, and of course I'm a general contractor, but if you have a good relationship with a general contractor and a good asset manager on your team, they can work directly together. And so that might be a way where you can effectively remove that construction management fee out of the picture 
and save that additional funding. Myself, our most successful projects are with the investor themselves. Somebody that can pick up the phone, I can pick up the phone and have a very candid conversation, a very positive or a very difficult conversation. There isn't multiple levels of managers that you, that will, you need to work with, like on most fee management approaches. So really work, uh, interview your property manager when it comes to time to talk about your value add plan. Um, also talk to your general contractor. They might be a recommendation they might have. There might be an outside consulting firm they could use as well. And so mm. use your tools, use your team to come up with the best plan on the renovation. Are you about to start a podcast or producing a podcast and tired of doing the editing yourself? We have produced over 1,000 daily shows and the production team that I've created, they're now available to produce shows for you as well. We can do as little or as much as you need from finding and communicating with guests, preparing introductions, to editing the audio and video. You will sound better, have a more professional presence, and be able to spend your time doing other valuable tasks on your business. Let me know you're interested by emailing me directly at Whitney at LifeBridgeCapital.com. Our guest is Garrett Lynch. Thanks for being on the show again, Garrett. I'm glad to be back. It's a great show. I know one place where you add a ton of value to the Nighthawk equity team, you know, is the operational value add, uh, just that side of the business. And, and it's just so important, right? And everybody talks about the, the value add business plan, right? That's what everybody's doing, value add. Some people say they're value add, some people say they're, they're not. But love to just jump in there and, how, and, and talk about how you all have added so much value to s- some specific pro- properties in that process. Yeah, so... What we're typically looking for is, you know, what's what's left on the property to really add value. And if you're looking at it in a very simplistic term, what we're really doing is, um, if you think about, we're, we're kind of doing like five-year flips for the most part. And so if you think about how you flip a house, like find a junky house that's, you know, th- that's not too junky, we're going to lose money and then renovate it. And then it's worth more and in a very simplistic way. And we're kind of doing that over, you know, five to seven year period for the most part, most people are doing, are doing that. And so what, what we're looking for are assets that are anywhere, you know, even in the late sixties, ideally the eighties, you know, built in the eighties up to the two thousands. And there's either an exterior and interior value add component. So we've got, you know, classic exteriors, or we've got classic interiors or a combination of both. And so like this last deal, we, we just purchased two deals back to back in Atlanta, 130 unit and 150 unit. Both had kind of different needs, but they both, but there was a lot of value to add to both in their own way. And so like the first one was complete exterior and interior renovation where we're, we're going and replacing roofs. We're adding siding on repainting, um, in fixing all the wood on the outside of the building. This particular building had an interesting architecture where it had these massive 30 foot gables on there. So we had to figure out how to modernize that. And we ended up talking to a designer, getting her involved, having her help us, help us come up with a strategy around that. And so we're putting windows and all those gables. We're going to take the railings and, and turn them horizontal. So we're going to put some cedar wood across the railings to give it more of a modern look. You see more and more of that. That changes happens. the look so much, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. And so that's something that we're doing there. I like to take spaces that have not been used. So like a tennis court or something that's that's just older on the property, an area that's that's unused. And we'll turn it into a combination of a dog park with turf, a uh, like grill station. So people to hang out and like grill out and stuff like that with seating. And then gaming. So like we're putting in uh, like bocce area and then a cornhole, stuff like that, all in this one section. So it's a really cool value add that you can turn any tennis court into. And so we just did that on our last deal and it's been a big hit. And so, and so we're doing, we're kind of taking that, piecing it in, into, you know, future properties. Other things you can do, hammock park, it's like hammocks. And that's a really simple and cheap way to add value that not a lot of people are doing. And one of my- What is that? What, what is a- what The hammock part. So you, you just get like some, you know, colored hammocks and you hang them around in an area and people can go and like lounge around and hang out. It's just something different. 
It doesn't cost that much to implement, but if you have like a bunch of open space, you can go out there and just yeah, throw a bunch of hammocks up and, and you got a hammock park. So that's kind of a cool little value add that we're doing. Really a big fan of resurfacing the pools and adding new furniture in those. It's not the cheapest all the time to do that. Pools are one expensive CapEx item that you got to look out for and you got to budget properly. So if you've never done a pool before, it just, it just costs a lot. And but it's worth it if it's a major amenity on site. And so, so doing that, I think, has been a, a big one. Um, I'm in the process of building a gym, which has been really cool. That that's been you get a fitness company that kind of specializes in that, and they'll set up the layout, and then you just build the space out, and then you put you put your gym equipment in there. So that's that's pretty nice. And then another one that a lot of people aren't doing that we're utilizing is is adding package lockers. They're electronic package lockers that you can put on even, you know, your mostly your B-class property is going to have a ton of value. Even C-class, you can use it, but it texts people when their packages are ready. And, and the great thing about this is it keeps people out of the office. So they don't have to go in, interact with your staff, bug them to get their package, whatever, lose their package. It's all, and then the vendors aren't coming in. If you really think about how much time it takes away from your staff on site, it, it adds up. And you're losing money because of that. So we'll we'll take it. We'll even go outside with it. There's a lot of them outside, and you 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 know hit up parcel pending or Luxor, one of these companies, and you can buy them outright if you put them in your capex budget. And then it literally a package shows up. You text it text the person. They come pick it up. 24 hours. Great amenity. That's and all of these things that I'm talking about. They all add up to wh- why are these important? Because people may not even use these. The majority of the people may not even use a lot of this stuff that you're, you're adding in, but it's for when you bring people to the property and you want to lease it at the higher rent, their lease, your leasing agent, if they're good, they're going to take them through all the amenities and they're going to say, Hey, this is all the extra stuff, the bells and whistles that we have. This is why our rents this. And people are going to have an easier time saying yes to that higher rent because they're like, I would use that. Yeah. I'm going to use the gym. Yeah. I'm going to use the pool and all these things. And whether they do or not, it doesn't really matter as much. Um, it's all about that leasing presentation and what you're able to provide to to them in that moment to get them to sign on the dotted line. And so, um, or even throw it on the internet and attract people in. Uh, if you have things that stand out that other people don't have, you're going to win those higher rents and you can lead the market in rents. And so um, it's, it's a chat. I've talked to multiple people about it. I'm like, how do we really monetize it down to the dollar? And it's tough. It's really hard to even do that. So you want to be conservative, still conservative on your underwriting. But man, if you hit it right, that thing, we, we did just that kind of stuff, like just that exterior stuff at a deal that we own in Huntsville, 276 unit. We were blowing past our target rents by $60 just on the exterior. And we had planned to do both the inside and the outside. So now I had the inside and now we're elevating it even further. So it's, it's wow. a really cool thing. Yeah, I mean, right there, you provided a list of things that each of us, uh, as or as operators, we should be looking at. You know, will these things add value? How much value? What should we expect? What do the neighboring properties have? I mean, you, you know, laid many things out there. One thing about the package lockers too, we've added that at a few properties, and I know a lot of other operators that are doing that. But and and you talked about just the operational component there of taking that labor off of your staff there. I mean, you can imagine if you got 150 units, all the packages. I mean, the way people order now online managing all those packages is a nightmare, yeah. um, you know, and then, you know, the, the risk of losing something or, you know, I mean, who's it, you know, fault? all these things, you know, uh, and just having that place where even that delivery person knows exactly where to go. I mean, it's just so much more efficient and secure. And so uh, that's a big value. I know to a lot of our tenants as well. And what about, I wanted to mention, what about you mentioned building gyms right now? Are you still looking at building gyms e- even during the COVID mess and everything that's happening right now? Yeah. We're talking about a, again, it's more for the show. So even if people can't use the gym necessarily out the gate or it it shuts on and off, I can use it as a sales tool. So I can take people, Hey, look at this awesome gym we just built. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's down for a few weeks for, because of COVID, maybe not, but it's, it's going to be up. You're going to be able to use it. It's I'm, I'm not only just adding the gym, but I want to use the most modern pieces to the gym. So like I'm adding Pelotons in mine. People love that. So they're, they're like right away, like, oh, they got Pelotons here. You know, instead of 
just a stair stepper machine or an elliptical or something, you add in more modernized stuff, maybe that mirror thing that people are doing, add that in instead where people are really like excited to use the equipment that you have. And you have to, because you likely have a smaller space, you want to really pick the pieces that are going to allow people to do a lot of stuff. And so, and so you can talk with whoever you're, you're building that with, but we're, you know, cables are good. I think having you know, dumbbells and, and stuff like that is, that's always really helpful and, and having a decent size. So it goes up. So there's a lot of range with that, but put a cool mural in your gym if you can. That's, that's a really cool thing to do. The carpet squares that, that like kind of offset each other. You can, you, you can go that route if you like, or the pat, the padded like foam. I mean, you can, you can do a, be real creative with it. And, and do whatever you can to make that gym look really cool. But it, again, it's, yeah, it's just a selling tool. And then there's one other one I forgot to mention that I, th- I think is awesome. You can pull it off. Your property allows it. Have a mechanical gate that kind of secures it. So you make it a gated community because you do that. You lower your cost and security by quite a bit. That adds a lot of security, a layer of security. If your property has had issues with that in the past or possibly has had issues, keeps all the riffraff out for the most part and it makes people feel safer. You can get higher quality staff, higher quality tenants. It's had a profound effect on our our deal in Huntsville, just making it a gated community. It's no one's, it's like a fortress now and it's awesome. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today.